We're super fortunate to have this, this hill, this elevation, because it's taking us away from the sea. It's giving us an opportunity to actually have like a microclimate to grow different plants um, that are more adapted to wanting, wanting drier feet, so to, so to say. Um, because when you're down into the swamp, there's certain things like mangoes, for example, struggle down there because they, they like a dry foot. We do have a dry root. So, you know, maybe we can grow mango up here. We'll, we'll see. You know, we have some avocados planted on the hill too because avocados also prefer a, a drier foot. Um, so, you know, having this like elevation, not only does it create a little bit more of a diverse ecosystem for us, but it also takes us away from the ocean, which could be, you know, potentially like really, really dangerous someday. Um, hopefully, hopefully it won't. Um, we're standing here under this tree. This is called a champadec or a tarap and it's in an articarpus. I can't remember the species for it. So it's a relative of like jackfruit and breadfruit and champadec, which we're gonna get to try. And uh, what else is in there? Bread nut. There's so many and it's a really, yeah. It's a really amazing um, genus of plants, trees, because they just produce such calorie rich, delicious, vitamin rich food. And they create all this biomass for us. Like look at all the leaves. Their roots hold really nice. They're, they're such beautiful plants. Um, so we have a lot of plants. We're a botanical collection, but also as a permaculture farm and thinking about analog forestry, we work with natives, of course. And what's a native? There's so many different kinds of plants. We have um, endemic plants. We have native plant species. We have naturalized plant species and we have invasives, right? And the invasives don't mean that they've been introduced. Like an invasive is really just indicative that there's damage done to the ecosystem or that there is not a keystone species that's, or a predatory species for that plant or animal to help keep it into check because there's so many different relationships in the forest. We have collaborative, cooperative, co competitive, symbiotic, parasitic, uh, predatory, and neutral relationships where some things just don't really affect each other. And so, you know, when things get out of balance, it's because there's damage done to the ecosystem and it's not there to keep itself in, in harmony because the forest really does keep itself in harmony. There's usually like a stage in like a middle-aged forest where things are trying to die, where possible diseases could set in just because of age. It's just like human beings, you know, like we start to age and diseases set in. And My teacher, Seven Song, he's like, the only thing for sure in life is death. He's kind of a morbid. He says he's emo come lately because um, he's like a 60 year old emo herbalist. <laughs> he's awesome. Um, so, yes. Um, so anyways, so we have, you know, the, the invasive species and then we have our native species. Come on up, you guys. Don't be shy. Um, we have our native species and the native species are the ones that are longest known to be in this area you know like human beings it's kind of like crazy that we think we can like know so much <laughs> even though we really do know so much but how do we really know like how these plants moved around the earth you know, like seeds can travel like thousands and thousands of miles like where do animals i mean think about like aquatic animals how far they can travel and so like for the plants that are native here to this area and to the the tropics of the america specifically where we are is called the isthmus of panama and so we're a land bridge in between um it really like the continent of north america stops like around like the end of mexico and guatemala i think technically is the isthmus of panama and so and then there's south america and so it's like the plates came together it drove up you know this this land where we are right now and so <clears throat> it's an ecotone meaning that it is in between two major ecosystems of north america of south america in between two oceans and so we get you know, species from the north, species from the south, as well as, and migratory species of like birds, so many birds here in Costa Rica, that, you know, what happens is that we also get adapted species that are just found in this area. And so that's why Costa Rica and the tropics are also specifically like Latin America, here Central America, is just so, so biodiverse. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's been mistreated throughout the years, of course, like through colonialism. But, you know, I also think it's part of why, like, the permaculture movement here is so strong. And it is that, like, we see the potential and how diverse it is. And Costa Rica itself, like, draws people from all over. You know, it's really such a beautiful ecotone. Um, so, but what you do see is a lot of species of plants from Southeast Asia. And so they would be naturalized in many ways. So things like mangoes, things like bananas, things like... Um, breadfruits, yucca, like there's a lot of these plants have been naturalized here because they were introduced by human beings and they filled a niche and they didn't 
overcompete with other plants and they became a part of the culture. And so if you ask people like, where's banana from? Like, they're gonna be like, oh, well, like if you ask a, a guy from the campesino, you know, from the countryside, where'd banana come from? He's like, what do you mean? It's from here. You know, and then I can be like, well, did you know that Alexander the Great, you know, brought it from Malaysia and it was like this delicacy in Greece that like this little like beautiful, you know, it's like, they don't know that kind of stuff that, you know, people like me, I guess, <laughs> would know. Plant someone, geeks. Plant geeks, <laughs> geeks. would know. <laughs> ethnobotanists <laughs> would know um, <laughs> because I don't know it's just what I study and so you know but what has happened is that those plants have become naturalized here you know they're a part of the culture they're a part of the ecosystem and then we have native plant species as well and natives are the ones that have been there the longest you know that have been adapted to and have really like co-evolved with the formation of the earth because our earth is constantly changing like it's been in so many different forms throughout its entire history so, um, yeah, you'll see a lot of plants from Southeast Asia because uh, it's an analogous ecosystem. So they get, you know, it's in the equatorial belt. They get similar amount of rain, similar amount of heat, all that. Also why you see like avocados and papayas. Those are native to the Americas, grown in other places too. So this is really a beautiful kind of area because we're on the lands, on the topography, we're up on the hill. And it's a cool, like if we're in a permaculture course right here, we would talk about a saddle dam actually because of the way that these two hills kind of meet together. Like we could put a little dam at the bottom there and collect nutrients as they run down the hill and possibly make a water feature. And so these whole hillsides right now are planted with fruit trees. Um, when you look at the base, at the bottom here where it's getting down closer by sea level it's really cool because there's a lot of um, indicator plants that are really you can see them you know because we talk about indicator plants like plants are going to tell you what is this ecosystem like what's the ground conditions like what's the water condition like etc um, and sometimes what you have to do is like really kind of zoom out and stand above like we are on a hill right now to see like what are some of those indicator plants and a lot of what i do is like i unfocus my eyes and i look at the shapes you know, we can also say like the vibration a little bit from the plant as well. But, you know, permaculture is about observation. It's about looking at the patterns to the details. But the whole part about indicator species is really cool because, you know, we've lived with these plants for a long time and people know it and you can see, you know, what's happening in a bioregion based on the plants that are there and understand the soil conditions and understand the water and understand what the pollinators are in relationship to other plants. In the 19, I think it was like in the 50s, 60s, uh, the Russians were so innovative actually in medicinal plant knowledge. Um, they were looking for minerals and trying to figure out like how to like where to mine minerals and get natural gas and all that and so they were doing it by indicator plant species and they would fly. There's a specific name to the study of working with plants to see what minerals and, and gases and stuff are underneath the ground but they would fly over and would look for big swaths of plants that would tell them what was under the soil. So before we had all the crazy mapping that we would do we were just doing it by looking at the plants. And so like an example of a natural resource that has a plant indicator species are goldenrod because they indicate shell below it and then underneath the shell is where natural gas is. So that's pretty cool, right? Very cool. Uh, I've yeah. seen that growing from my house all the way up to Maine. Uh -huh. Different species. But yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. the Appalachians, which is full of natural, yeah. natural, you know, fossil fuel. Yeah, so here, you know, it's like as you're looking down, you can see like there's like musaceae, which are ones that are in like the banana family birds of paradise, there's like some really beautiful lilies. And then you really have to kind of like unfocus your eyes again when you're trying to imagine what a landscape's gonna look like. So it's like, there's this hill here and a lot of vines growing. And so we, we have been taking down some of the vines. Again, the vines, they can be, they can be hard on the forest. Um, they can take these big trees down. And so what we really wanna do is possibly put like, um, uh, what's it called? like a, a shala, like a dance studio, and like a kitchen, and like a co-working, and some habitation up here, because again, this is like the future of the farm. Um, over there on that hill, we envision like a really beautiful platform, and like doing some chinampas in here. Some beautiful ponds and water features. So you guys are really planning for climate change. You have to. Yeah. I mean, it's stupid not to. It's like, if you're not, like you're just living in the present moment, and it's like, for me, when people are like, oh, just be present. 
it's kind of like, oh, live in the flow. It's like, well, actually, like, we need to, we do need to think of the future in some ways, you know, because it's just our generation. It's like, if we're just living in the flow and being present, then who else are we thinking about but ourselves? And so I think it's kind of selfish, you know, to not be like thinking to the future. You know, it's like, we're here because <laughs> I always like to say that, like, blame our grandparents for where we are now. And it's not their fault either. It's just kind of like how paradigm like took them. You know, it's like things got easier. Things became mass produced. It's like we romanticize what it was like to live back in the day in the country. You know, it was hard. Like people lived to be like 40 and they broke their backs all day, you know, and like tilling the land. It's like not easy to till the land. It's really hard work. And I'll say it like right now, like I'm not a farmer, you know, I'm like a little bit of a gardener. You know, I tend plants, I harvest plants. I like cook plants, I make medicines with plants, and I love the ecosystem and talking about the ecosystem and being with the forest, but I don't, I'm not a farmer, like I'm not growing food. I depend on other people to grow my food and not everyone's a farmer. You know, there's some people, like people have different skills and the people who are farmers, like they're some of the baddest asses we have in the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're the ones that are keeping us alive and going, so. Cecropia is really cool. It's like um, a pioneer species. In Spanish, we call it tacotal, and so it comes into damaged ecosystems. It has a short life, like maybe only six, seven, eight years. It's very hollow. Uh, it has a relationship with an ant, and so it has this like complete symbiotic relationship. The ant keeps it clean. Um, <clears throat> the and the Cecropia provides sugar and habitat for the ant. The leaves that we were just talking about. What are so interesting about them is that they're an amazing bronchial dilator, and so for that like chest congestion, a little bit of an asthma kind of feeling, that tightness, that wheezing. Um, even people who are having like a cough or they can't like catch a good breath, you can make it into a tea or you can smoke it. And smoking it, you're not using the smoke as a preventative because smoking doesn't make your lungs better. Um, but you take it just like a few inhalations like you would do off of an inhaler and it works amazing. And so it's a very tall tree. Um, the leaves are hard to harvest when they're very tall because they'll fall and they'll be all brown and gross. Like you want like vital green leaves that you then dry. And so you want to find babies around it and harvest them. Or if you take a cecropia down because sometimes they, they do get cut down because they're, like I said, they don't live very long. You know, they're a pioneer species and when they get really tall and they fall, they're still a tree falling and so it could fall on another fruit tree, it could fall on your house, it could fall on your car, whatever. Um, so sometimes we, we will cut them down and when you cut them down you literally have to like let them be for like three days and let the ants go find another cecropia and then you can harvest from it. And supposedly the fruit tastes like gummy bears. I've never had the opportunity to try it uh, but Pete here is saying that it's like one of the most delicious things that you've ever had and so I really hope to try it someday. Um, the cecropia like their fruit, they're like long and they hang down, they look like big spaghetti hairs or something. And um, we've had so many toucans. You can hear the toucan. That is the uh, chestnut mandible toucan. So it's a very big toucan. It has a brown underside here. And uh, the keel build, which is like the toucan sam toucan and the aracaris, as well as the oriopendulas and other birds have all just been like all over lately eating the cecropia fruit. So this is kratom or kratom, tomato, tomato, depending on which gringo is saying it. Um, it's this really amazing plant that we'll, we'll see what happens to it. You know, in the United States, it went up to be reviewed to be put into like the class one kind of drug category, which is just ridiculous, really, because it's this amazing medicine. Um, like all medicines, the, the, the healing benefits and the dangers are in the dosage, you know, whether it's like garlic or it's something like kratom or it's something like coca or it's something like cannabis or something like sugar you know it's like the again it's it's really about the dosage um and so this plant native to southeast asia it is amazingly used for withdrawal symptoms 
opiate withdrawal, all kinds of different kinds of withdrawal for people, you know, and there's such an issue with addiction in our world, um, many different kinds of addiction, whether it's like to food, to sex, to shopping, to, to plants, <clears throat> you know, but this one in particular for opiates, um, as well as others, I'm sure, that I just haven't studied yet. I've been learning about it and really like, as we're learning about the plants, what's important is to, not to just read about the plants, that's easy, especially for like, heady people like me that like to read a million things at once like where you really get to know the plan is in the embodied experience which is taking it so the <laughs> um and so you want to be you know like experiencing the plant like not just as the living plant right here and like standing with it and touching it and letting it acknowledge you and propagating it like we're doing with these air layers and sticking it up so that maybe it fell over a little bit looks like it got worked a little bit maybe by some wind or maybe a guy that was too big went up there to prune it you never know um, so there's that, but then there's also like the imbibing of the plant and really like sitting with the plant and thinking about the plant and how does it make, our, make us feel, you know? But also like what Kratom does, what it's known for medicinally is that it's a stimulating sedative. And so that sounds super contradictory, uh, but that's plants, you know, like they're, they're not cut and dry. They have this like really amazing innate intelligence in them that, you know, helps, that, that interacts with our complex bodies, with their complex bodies and will you know, cause different reactions depending on the parts that you harvest sometimes, depending on where your physical constitution is when you're eating or taking or imbibing in the plants and how it's going to react with you and also your intention. You know, it's like we look at how perverted sugar has become and how, how much it hurts us again, but in like small doses, it can be, you know, like, like agua de sapo, like the sugar cane juice. That's just actually full of minerals and like blood building. It's super high in iron. That's like molasses and brown sugar. That's iron right there that we get from from sugar. So, but it's also about how much are you taking. And it's like even with the the sugar cane juice, if I'm sitting there just like 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 all day long, like I'm gonna have trouble, you know. But it's like if I need it and it fits my constitution, and like maybe a dose of you know a sugar cane juice would be good for me every day. It really is so much dependent on the person. And so with the the kratom. Kratom. Um, there's the leaves are what we use. There's a few different varieties. Um, I just learned from my friend Katrina, who learned from our friend Vince, um, who is like a retired pharmaceutical rep, really knows his chemistry super good. He's an herbalist. He's like transitioning into herbalism and his understanding of chemistry and the human body is so applicable for people learning herbal medicine because he just gets how the plants work on this other level, you know? And it's like, as we're learning about the medicinal plants, you learn about them on all different kinds of levels. So this plant does this, or this plant grows in this environment, or this plant likes to be propagated this way, and this is the pollinator, and this is how you prepare it. And like, there's so many different levels to know of, of the plant. Also like their stories in relation to human beings, like with mythologies and fairy tales and all of that. So um, she said that these red leaves, these new leaves here, are more sedative. What was it, Katrina? The younger ones. The youngest are the red. They're the most sedative. They're the most sedative. The yellow green ones these. are lightly stimulating. Lightly the stimulating. Ones are the most, stimulating. most stimulating. And so they're what they're doing is they're developing alkaloids at different times, like as they mature. Um, and so one of the reasons why in the is it the FDA. Is that who puts things on DEA. DEA? And so, you know, the DEA, what they've decided is because you can develop a dependency, you can develop a tolerance to this. And so what other plants do we develop tolerance for? Tobacco, sugar, coffee, black tea, mate, like they're alkaloids essentially. And so nut sugar, but you know, those other plants that I mentioned have alkaloids in them, which can become very addictive because they make us feel good. Um, so, and, you know, another reason why, and this is where we can take this where we want to, is probably why they want to make it a, a class one, you know, drug, is because it actually gets people off of pharmaceuticals. If you want to learn about medicinal plants, there's so many different resources. What I encourage you to do is really think about your bioregion first, you know, and who is there practicing in my bioregion? Who knows the plants here? And then what I also recommend you do is go to conferences. It's the best way to learn from many different herbalists, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and see like, do I like this person's teaching style? Do I like their philosophy or what they're about? Do I vibe with that person? You know, because sometimes you look online or you read someone's book and you're like, whoa, this person's a badass, they're amazing. And then you see them speak and you're like, oh my God, I can't stand their voice. Or that person has bad breath or whatever. You know, you don't want to study with that person. And so go to conferences. There's so many, you know, depending on where you are, just look it up. Herbal Conference Northeast, Herbal Conference Ireland, Herbal Conference Spain, Herbal Conference South Africa, Herbal Conference Costa Rica. And you're going to find the people who are there practicing with the medicine plants because 
These are our oldest allies. They're our ancestors, and we're hold. It's up to us to hold, hold their heritage, you know, and to pass it on to to other people. And there's this beautiful resurgence, this renaissance in herbal medicine, especially for people who come from Western culture, you know, where our traditional knowledge with the plants was really quite uh, systematically wiped out. It's a whole other other conversation I'd like to talk about, um, but. You know, like learn and get yourself out there and read like as many books as you can, but also like be with the plants and find the people that you resonate with to, to learn from. And if you want to learn from me, <laughs> um, I do this course, this amazing course called Permaculture for the Herbalist Path, which is a 72 hour permaculture course followed by like another 70 hours of herbal studies and really looking at the integrated relationship between human beings and the living earth and how, you know, the systems of the earth are just really mimicked within our body. And so looking at how can we be therapeutic ecologists? How can we really, you know, tend the land, but also tend our human vitality? Because being a part of the land, it's like we can't separate ourselves. There is no difference between what's below us and above us and like where we are right here, right now. And so, you know, the course, it really goes deep into, it's a PDC. So you get like your soil science and your earthworks and hydrological cycle and all the fun stuff that you get from a permaculture design course. But then we're talking about the energetics of the plants, we're doing anatomy and physiology, and we're going through about 50 different plants in our Materia Medica that are coming from all other areas. Because I really want people to understand that <clears throat> being into their bioregion, but also knowing we're a global society, so knowing about plants from other bioregions. And so, you know, we'll study a traditional Chinese plant, we'll study some tropical plants, we'll study like a, a North American or a European plant, we'll bring in an Ayurvedic plant, you know. And so each unit, we're really thinking about global Materia Medica and then encouraging people to go back and learn from your bioregion. But, you know, so I'm doing that now two times a year. It's a long immersive, it's 26 days. Um, probably gonna expand to 28 days. Also trying to set up something here in Costa Rica that's like a, a 13 month, like spread out for people who are local here. And then someday you'll get a book. We'll see like, where that comes from or maybe more videos or I don't know. So awesome. stand by. And also be a little bit of an expectorant and the leaves.